Worm farming or vermicomposting is a really accessible way to compost for a ton of different garden situations. Everybody from a balcony apartment to a big permaculture orchard can utilize worm farming to help them make compost in an easy way and sometimes even uh, easier than traditional composting methods. And today I'm here with uh, my friend Danica, who those of you who've been following me for a while will probably recognize her voice and her name from the Discord. Um, you can access that via my Patreon, but she has been a very good resource for me as far as somebody who is new to gardening and helping me think through again what it's like to be a beginner. But in this instance, she is the expert and she's going to lead me through making my own worm composting farm. And uh, through that, we are going to teach you how to do it. And hopefully me being a beginner myself will help you guys uh, get through all the questions that you might have if you're starting this on your own. So the first thing you need with starting a worm bin is obviously a bin. And then the second most important thing is some ventilation. So that is what I will get you to start with is go ahead and drill some holes to the top of your worm bin. If you want, you can do the side, the top sides. Does um, it matter how big these holes are? No, so the worms, they can get out of these if they really want to, but ideally we keep the condition inside the bin in a, uh, a condition prefer pre preferable to them. <laughs> so it's so good they don't want to leave even though they can. Right, yeah, okay. they, they are photophobic, so they won't like to come out of the light. So now that we have the bin topped with holes in it for ventilation, we are ready to add some bedding. Okay. Bedding has to be moist, uh, about the dampness of a wet sponge that's been squeezed out. Okay, so what we have here is shredded cardboard. It's my favorite bedding. A lot of different beddings you can use. Um, shredded paper, cardboard, cocoa choir, um, aged manure. Nothing that's going to get really hot really quickly like um, in other compost. Anything that would count as brown, exactly. Um, some people use straw. Uh, some people... Some people use peat moss. I would not recommend it. It can get a little acidic and it's not eco environmentally um, renewable. So yes, leaves, leaves yes. are great. Okay. Um, the only problem that may have with leaves is if you want a really fast vermicompost, the stem on leaves are a little bit fibrous mm. and it will take the worms a little bit longer to get through. They'll still eat it. Okay. It will take a little bit longer than cardboard. Okay. So. Now that we have our bedding, we need to get it wet so that way it is habitable for the worms. I'm gonna let you do this. Just, you feel free to use this. Get a lot of, yep, get tons of that in there and go ahead and put that in the water. This is such a good idea. I love this. I had this from my dormitory and it was getting no use. And I was like, what can this be used for? What were you doing beforehand? Um, so before I got the shredder and the shredder has saved my life, I was tearing up cardboard into about golf ball size pieces, okay. soaking them. Um, I have a five gallon bucket that I was using and then yeah, go from, and then just tearing, soaking. Um, I would tear while watching TV sometimes. It just, it took a long time. So if you can get something that is already shredded or have a friend with a shredder mm -hmm. um, or splurge and get one yourself, it saves a ton of time. Yeah, I can see that. Definitely not necessary, but super helpful. Right, yep. This and you can put whole pieces of cardboard in there. They'll eventually get through there, but um, as far as the bedding goes, you want something a little bit, you know, smaller, about golf ball size okay. for them to start, but then you can start throwing whole pieces in. So is this going to be dry enough now that it's not dripping? So we get a handful, we squeeze, no, no water's coming out, but our hands are still a little damp. So that, I think, is perfect. Okay. And we just dump it in. Dump it in. Do we want to cover the whole bottom? Yes. We want to give them at least two to three inches. You can give them more, um, but at least two to three inches. So, so there's no maximum? You can't like drown them in bedding or anything? No. They will eat the bedding in its full. The only way you can drown them is if you give them too much moisture. Okay. Um, and that is part of the reason the ventilation holes are great. It helps things water evaporate. Um, and if your bin is getting too wet, Throw some dry bedding in, you know? Move stuff to the side, put handfuls of dry bedding on the bottom, and this will wick up the moisture and you can skip this step once you have an establishment, of course. But that is the 
number one thing that new worm farmers are fighting is moisture levels. For people who are, want to be super scientific about it, do you know what the, like if you had a moisture sensor, like what number you'd be going for? 80% uh, moisture. Okay. Yep. I do not have a moisture reader myself. Um, most people do just the wrung out sponge consistency. And, and this works really well for almost everybody. But if you want to really get scientific about it, you can get a thermometer, moisture reader, and make your worms very happy. Okay, so I'm at about maybe an inch and a half there. All right. I don't know. My, my sense of, of depth is really bad. <laughs> yeah. I would give them probably double this. So okay. there's not much right here. And we want to be able to cover food. When we put food in here, we don't want food to lay on the top because it will start smelling and flies and things will get to it. You oh, want to have enough okay. to cover it. So we want like a, a food sandwich. Bedding, food bedding? Perfect. Yep. So we've got our bedding up to about three inches or so. What is our next step? Our next step is to add a little bit of grit. So worms have gizzards and the grit helps them kind of break down food a little faster. Okay. Um, and grit can be rock dust, it can be oyster shell dust. What I have here is powdered eggshell. Okay. Um, this is what I use the most because I like to recycle mm -hmm. and uh, we go through a lot of eggs. So I have eggshells on hand and I just have this old coffee maker that, or coffee grinder, grinder thank yeah. you, <laughs> um, that I blitz it on up in. So it doesn't have to be scientific. How much of it do we need? I was about to say that. Doesn't yeah. need, it, doesn't, okay. it doesn't have to be scientific. I do a sprinkling on top, especially for new Ben. Mm -hmm. I like to give them a little bit extra. And honestly, I sometimes only add it at the beginning of the bed, beginning of making a new um, bin because is it, it's like something that lives in their stomachs forever, right? Right. And yeah. as gross as it may sound, they'll poop it out and, and then the, eat it again and eat it again. So you, you don't need to add a ton, okay. but when you get started, it's really nice to have some. Is it possible to add too much and have it like cut them somehow? No. Um, if they don't need it, they won't eat it. Um, okay. You can have too much of some types of grit. I've heard oyster shells can be really salty and mm. salt will kill worms. Okay. So, um, but eggshells, it actually helps balance the pH. It adds a lot of calcium, which is going into your soil. So uh, all good things with eggshells. So you can put as much as you want. I haven't had any issues with that. So I'll let you yeah. add it and you can sprinkle it right on top. I used about half of this. Uh, and we have a, like a pretty good covering on here now. And you said something just now that I thought was very good advice. Right, and I should have mentioned it earlier. Um, eggshell dust is not great to breathe in. It um, can cut up your lungs a little bit. It is a very fine powder. So if you can smell it, you're too close, back away. It's great for your worms, not great for you to breathe in. All right, so we have mixed in the eggshells that I had on top, and the next step is to add our worms. So what do we have here? Right, we have a mix here of two worms, red wigglers and Indian blues. I did not know it was a mix when I first got it. Um, it was called red, red wigglers and in a little apostrophe or asterisk, yeah. it said mix and it was like, it could be these three worms. Um, and when you... I first got it, they were mostly Indian blues. Where did you get them from? I got them from Uncle Jim's worm farming. Okay. Yep, uh, I started with I think it was either 250 or 500 worms. Wow, that's so many more than I would have thought. It was about, I could put them in one hand. It really was not a lot. Like, wow. okay. they've really exploded. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get some for you. Yeah, I think, um, so what's the, what's the difference between the, the red wigglers and the, the indigo ones? Indian blues. Indian blue. Yep, the red wigglers, they are the classic composting worm. They eat anything really quickly. Um, they're not temperamental. They will eat and breed at a wide range of temperatures, 50 Fahrenheit to about 80, and they can survive freezing to about 90. Wow. Okay. So they have a good range. And if they do die, their cocoons, the eggs that they lay, they can survive in less than ideal conditions. And once conditions are good, they will rehatch. Nice. Um, the Indian blues are much more temperamental. They We'll climb the walls if anything changes. Um, the atmospheric pressure, if it you know starts raining, they're gonna be climbing the walls. Um, if, it, if you added a food that they don't particularly like, 
they'll be trying to escape they are just a little bit harder to deal with sometimes but they eat really quickly um, and they breed really quickly they still do pretty well in this bend so it's a mix of both and they get the job done uh, and I'll try to point out the difference to you if I can um, how are these worms different from like like regular earthworms that you would find regularly in your garden right so earthworms especially the ones in, that you find in the garden they will go down a foot some species go two three feet some will even go down to 15 feet composting worms really like to stay in like the top six inches they don't need much more and that's why we didn't add a whole ton they will go down like if there's food there um you know if you fill your bin all the way up to the top they'll eat it but you'll see the most of them will stay up at the top three four inches okay so like a regular earthworm would eventually compost things but the red wigglers are more ideal for specific composting yes they eat newly newly added kitchen scraps much quicker than any other worms gonna eat them um a lot of the traditional earthworms they're eating stuff after it's already decomposed for a while um they're eating dirt spitting out dirt and they're not eating a ton of freshly organic matter so you ready to get some worms yeah so am i just gonna scoop these and put them in here yes and one other note that i didn't think to add until now is before you get your worms go ahead and make your bedding the reason why it's okay for you mm -hmm. is i'm giving you a lot of the bacteria the um, fungi all the microorganisms that are needed for a healthy worm bin okay um, so that you can add worms immediately. So if I wasn't getting my worms from you and I was getting them in a package, what would I need to do? Make this exact same mix. Maybe add a tiny bit of kitchen scrap, um, like a really small piece of banana peel or carrot top, whatever you have. What, when you say really small, is it like, like this big? Yeah, just something for micro microorganisms to start eating on. Okay. And, and those microorganisms are like falling out of the air, right? Yeah, they're, they're getting in there whether you like it or not. Okay. Um, <laughs> There's no stopping them, so. Yeah, good note. Yep, and you only need to do that about a week in advance. You don't need to do it a whole, whole lot. So as soon as you order the worms, go ahead and make your bin and let it sit and it'll be perfect by the time you get your worms. Awesome. So I'm gonna, I guess, start taking handfuls. Yep. Um, do I need to take from over here or over here? This was the second to last feeding. Mm -hmm. So there should be some here. And then the most will be in here because that was watermelon. So either one of these sections will be good. And you'll notice it's a lot warmer in the bend than outside. And they, um, they do well. They, they keep themselves warm. Oh my goodness. And you already have food. So I don't know if we will add food because you're picking up some watermelon pieces. Okay. And while I'm going through here, I can try to find a red wiggler and an Indian blue. See yeah. if I can spot the difference for you. How much of this am I gonna need? Um, let me s walk around and see how many you've taken. I started with the 500, so as long as you have about that, you're probably good. Oh yeah, you got you got a big worm ball here. I think you're fine. Oh, that's all I need? There's there's probably at least 200 in this little batch. Wow, okay. Okay, so on this side, we have the red wigglers. These guys are a little fatter, and at the tail, you can see that it has a yellow tail. This one's really showing it well. So that is a classic red wiggler. Um, another thing is this little saddle area near them. That is their clitellum, and that is raised on a red wiggler. So it's not as flat as say the blues. And the blues, they will get really skinny, they will stretch out, and you can see this clitellum, really hard to see, right? You can almost not see it. Um, and these guys have a little bit of a blue sheen if you shine the light on them just right. But they're just, these guys like to move around a lot more. You can see that on my hand. They're already trying to find a way to escape. A little skinnier. Um, and their clitellum is not nearly as pronounced and raised as the red wigglers. <laughs> um, well, I think you have a good basis for a worm bin. I'm excited that you're getting started. Awesome. Can, Can we talk about um, how I should feed them? Yeah, of course. So there's a lot of different ways to feed them. Um, the method I have been doing the most, and it's worked really well for me, is sectional feeding and your bin is big enough to do that okay so what i would do about once a week give them some food scraps on one side and then next week give them some on the other side now the reason for this is instead of putting it all on top or um, putting it right in the middle if you give them something the worms don't really like they can get away um, and that's the biggest thing if you have enough room to let them get away 
even if you add citrus or onion or things that some people say you shouldn't add to a worm bin, they'll just move away until, you know, the other organisms have broken it down enough for them to eat it, then they'll move right back over. Okay, perfect. So, is there like a limit to how high I could fill this? Like if I could keep it all like mostly piled on one side, could I fill it like to the top on this side and then leave this side as it is? Or is that going to be too weird for them? No, they will survive in, yeah, they'll survive in that system. Um, some people do that intentionally at really large scales and that's called a wedge system where they just feed one side and they slowly add new stuff over. Mm. And by the time that they're on this side, this is ready to harvest. All the worms have moved over because there's no food and they harvest that out, so. That's actually a good point. We need to talk about what to do with your compost, how to know it's done, and how to get it out. Well, doneness is um, a bit of chooser's choice, dealer's <laughs> choice there. So honestly, I could put this right here that I have in the garden and it will work just fine. Um, I won't because I want it to be broken down a little bit more it will, it should still be a really fluffy consistency, but you shouldn't see big chunks of bedding or big chunks of food. If you have some foods that take a while to break down, if you put like grape stems in there or a pumpkin stem or corn cobs, um, they'll eat all the corn, but the cob will remain. You can sift those out, put them back in and whatever you sift out, you can then remove and put in your garden. How long would it be between me starting this and me seeing a section of it that is like ready? Probably about six months. Okay. So it really depends on how much worms you have and how much um, you're feeding them and how much bedding they have. So I want to say we probably gave you about a pound of worms. So that is around a thousand worms. Um, and ideally you can put anywhere from 500 to 2000 worms in a square foot. Um, and the more you have, the faster they'll go through things. And it depends on what you feed them to. Uh, cardboard will go pretty quickly, especially really um, shredded like this stuff. But if you give them cocoa choir or start them in like wood chips or straw, something that's going to take a little longer for them to break down, mm -hmm. it's going to take longer for your compost to finish. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do to speed it up. But if you're just adding whatever food scraps you have and sticking with um, a system similar to mine, it's probably going to be six months before you can harvest. Okay. And then as far as how often to feed, did I hear you saying one week, do this side, one week, do this side? Yep. That is about what I do, but feel free to check up on them in four days. And if they finish all the food, you can give them some. Um, in a week, if they still have a lot of food from the last feeding, I probably wouldn't feed them. I'd probably wait another couple of days. Okay. And they'll definitely like move away from an area when there's no more actual edible stuff there for them. Right. And the bedding is all edible. So they're going to eat the bedding completely. Okay. Um, so that's why it's going to take a while for your bed to really get started. Um, I basically redid this one recently, but they were going through food and bedding in a month or two. And I was able to harvest a month or two. Okay. Yeah. So six months to get the first batch of compost, but after that you could get a batch like every month or so. Yep. Nice. Yep. All right. So I'm going to put my top on and then I'm done? I believe so, yeah. Um, well, they'll let you know when they're not happy. If they start climbing the walls, um, <laughs> feel free to message me and we can work <laughs> through a solution on why they may not be happy. Yeah. Yep. And also, joining the Discord is a great way to get not only my advice, but also Danica's direct advice on a lot of things. Um, the link is always below for you to check out the Patreon and join the Discord and actually like send us pictures of what's going on and uh, get our feedback on that. Um, that's a really valuable resource for me, I know for sure. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any sort of questions that pop up on there. We're not gonna feed your bin to start off. Let it get established for a couple of days and then you can start feeding it. But this bin has not been fed in about a week and that was the last feeding section. So I'm gonna feed them over here and I'll just kind of show you what I do. So typically, when you already kind of mess with these guys, so I'm not going to mess with them a lot more. Typically, each time I come through and I feed them, I fluff up the bedding a little bit. I check the consistency. I can see here on the sides, it's getting a little dry, but the middle is preferable for them. So with this one, I'm not going to add more bedding because it is a little dry. I'm just going to add the food scraps. If it was a little wet, I'd put dry bedding and then I'd put the food scraps. But do you ever find yourself having to add water? Um, I did when I first started. Um, the really good thing about vermicast, worm poop, is it 
contains all the mucus that is on them and everything and it is very good at moisture holding mm. um when i first started i felt like they were too dry and they were telling me they were too dry and so i did add a little bit okay i don't recommend it though because that is the hardest problem to deal with in an established warm bin is it's getting too wet like this is kind of surprising me that's a little dry here um but i'm listening to the bin it's telling me it's a little dry on the sides you know if you feel yeah. this i can see that this looks kind of dry yeah even and i think it's because we turn the heat on inside mm. so it's getting dried out a bit that way so i'm not going to add more bedding and i like to leave a little bit of bedding on the bottom okay. when i add food and then these guys since we did take a good bit out of them i'm not going to give them a full feeding normally i feed them about a gallon size food every week but since their population is down i'm going to do about half of this and i always freeze my food before i put it in it's not oh. a necessity but it is something i enjoy doing um it kills fruit gnat eggs and it also kills any seeds and i don't want seeds to be growing in here that's so important i have such a big problem with fruit flies and uh yeah seeds in your compost is always a, a big issue yeah so they are getting and this is cold still frozen um i let it thaw for a couple of hours but it's still very cold and it's not going to bug the worms any they will move over to this side and they're getting melon which is called a fast food they eat this really quickly um any fast foods are things that are soft and things that are sweet they have a they have a sweet tooth um long-term foods are going to be the really stemmy stuff or um, stuff that is maybe not their favorite foods um tomatoes onions things that are a little acidic mm -hmm. they're not going to get to really quickly so this is only fast foods form this time just because this is what i have frozen so i have a bit of cabbage here and some melon and they will go through these pretty quickly all right that's about half a gallon worth and then i just cover it up and it's important to cover it up by a good layer i was probably about two inches because again that keeps other pests from finding it and as long as i've been covering up i haven't had any sort of pest issue um you know not, i haven't had a fruit fly outbreak or cockroaches or anything getting in there and i leave my bin open for majority of the time any questions um how do you decide when to put the lid on and when not to good good question and that is a little bit of experience based um i take the bin top off when i notice particularly the blues trying to escape and they're not trying to escape as much as there is condensation all along the walls and all along the top it's and too wet it's it's yeah it's wet but if you look into the bin the bin's not necessarily wet the bedding is fine mm. just condensation is building up and they have a good time surfing the walls they enjoy <laughs> it so <laughs> um i i take the the top off mainly to let the the worms stay where they need to stay and not and they don't like climbing a drywall okay so um another thing you can do to help mitigate that if you want to keep the top on is a layer of dry bedding on top because then they hit the dry bedding and they're like eh, i don't like this and they go right back down oh awesome it was great um getting your first warm bed started thanks for letting me do this thank you so much for agreeing to do this on camera <laughs> uh, no it was a lot of fun it was